The Atari VCS, for better or worse, is finally making its way to backers, including yours truly. And you can check out my first impressions video up in the corner. And remember, it's a first impressions, not a review. I won't give a review until it's closer to release. In that first impressions video, I mentioned the UI and a lot of you wanted me to go a bit deeper into it. So I'm giving the people what they want. Just a quick disclaimer before we begin, Atari has stated that the software included is not final, so any issues that I run into this video that's posted in December will hopefully be resolved in due time. I figured I'd put that up top before the comments roll in about how I'm either being too harsh or that I bought a $300 potato. The video will be broken down into chapters so you can take a peek at anything specific, and I'll start with an overview and conclude with any changes that I want to see happen. If you want to see more Atari VCS stuff or have any questions, please leave a comment below and subscribe for future content. If you're not too interested in Atari VCS, fret not, this channel won't be an Atari VCS exclusive channel and I do have a handful of non-VCS videos planned, so to my new subscribers, I hope you stick around for non-VCS content. So let's get into the UI of the Atari VCS. When you first boot up the system, it will default to the home screen, which houses all your apps that you have downloaded onto the system. Up top, you have a couple of tabs to choose from. Home, Games, Apps, Stores, and System. Home will display all of your apps at once, and if you fill up nine squares, additional applications will show up to the right, and you can see them peeking off to the corner there. Currently, you can't rearrange the applications in any way, and it would at least be nice to snap them to alphabetical order but you can at least view all of your games or all your apps simply by going up to the tab on the top and selecting the relevant one. If you're down at the bottom of your screen, don't worry, hitting the left menu button on your controller will bring you all the way to the top. So you can see that my games are separated and my apps are separated, and I'll go over each game and app individually in a bit, but first I want to give you a showdown of the rest of the UI. Next up is the store, which is important for any new console or PC hybrid or whatever you want to call the Atari VCS, and from here you can buy games and download apps. The store, like I mentioned in my previous video, is laid out in these little tiles that look like original Atari 2600 box art, at least the ones that first appeared in the 70s and early 80s. I know Atari had a ton of different variations of box art. But moving on, you can see that they have a featured row, game row, and apps row. Since the store is not populated with a lot of items, there's not a lot to go over, but the game store has expanded from seven, as stated in my first video, to one, two, three, 13 games on the storefront, and 15 if you count the Air Console and Antstream Arcade as games. As previously stated in my first impressions video, prices range from two free games which are offered to backers, Missile Command Recharged and Unsung Warriors Prologue, then ranging from $3.99 to $24.99. And there are currently only two games exclusive to the Atari VCS, Sir Love Lot and Thrustlander. The rest are available on Steam and the real kicker is Gun Tech which is listed for $25 on the VCS store but only $10 on Steam but the rest are within reason compared to the Steam store. Games have descriptions next to them along with screenshots and lists of compatible controllers. I just wish that they would have the entire page filled with screenshots and video of the gameplay instead of having to go into each different tab. Purchasing these games is pretty straightforward. You just enter in your credit card information and click purchase. According to Twin Blasters, the site that they use isn't that secure, so just to be safe, I used a card generated by privacy.com. I really hope that they work to improve the security of this because any type of security concerns is going to be a problem at launch. Now let's move on to the systems tab, and from here you can manage settings like removing the required pin at sign-in. And it's nice to have a pin, but just cumbersome if you're using a controller or if you're the only one using the Atari VCS. Then you have the general settings which include the set display, and I have it set at 1080p since I don't have a 4K set yet, preferences which allow you to change the name of your Atari VCS, and set a sleep timer after inactivity, and the system language. Then you have controls which just shows you what the buttons do for the joystick or the gamepad. And then system updates which checks for updates on the system, and BIOS, and a factory reset option. 
Network is pretty straightforward, just allows you to change the Wi-Fi you're connected to or manage Ethernet settings. Moving on to devices, this will allow you to turn the Bluetooth off if you want, see paired devices, and see any available Bluetooth devices that you can pair to. It also gives you the option to pair new controllers, but when I tried to pair my Xbox One controller that way, the Bluetooth icon just blinked forever, so now pairing it from my devices seems to be the easiest way to go. And the last part of the devices tab is update, and this will push an update to your Atari branded controllers. I only have the classic controller and it's currently up to date. Let's move on to storage. This allows you to manage what's on the eternal storage, which there are 32 gigs by default. Now, I mentioned in the previous video that you can install an M.2 SATA SSD, but you can also plug in a USB flash drive. It does, however, need to be formatted for the Atari VCS itself, so you will need a drive specifically for the VCS. Plugging it into a Windows machine will prompt Windows to ask if you want to format the drive, so keep that in mind. Right now I've used 12 gigs of storage, but it is pretty easy to transfer stuff over to the flash drive if I need to. Also part of the system tab is power. Now this used to be a big deal when I was writing this episode because the only way that you could power the system down was to go into this menu and it would take 14 steps to get to this menu from the home screen. But now you can click on your profile in the top right corner of your screen and there's a power option right there. This option will allow you to put the console to sleep, restart, or turn the system off completely. Now that the tabs are outlined, let's take a look at my games and applications. And starting out with the games, I purchased Sir Lovelot, which is kind of like Super Meat Boy meets Celeste. You go around each level looking for coins and a golden goose while searching for a flower to give your maiden. It's a pretty decent game with a nice retro style and I look forward to playing with it more, and best of all, it's exclusive to the Atari VCS for now. The other games that I have downloaded are Missile Command Recharge, which is also available on your phone for free, and it's an updated version of Missile Command, and this game does take advantage of your joystick as well, so using the spinner is a bit better than dragging your joystick over, but nothing really beats having a trackball. The other game that I have is the Atari Volt, which is included with the Atari VCS, and like I mentioned in my previous video, it contains 20 arcade titles and the rest are 2600 games. The arcade games feel a ton better to me because I didn't grow up with 2600 games, and the 2600 games allow you to set the difficulty and other options just like you would on the normal original Atari through the Switches. The other game that I have is Unsung Warriors Prologue, which is a nice platformer. The gameplay includes sword swings, shield block, and long range arrow shooting, and you can collect coins to purchase moves and items, and it's a pretty good game for free. Then you have Air Console and Ant Stream Online, and I'm planning on making a separate video on Ant Stream because it has a ton of features and this video is getting long enough already, but in short, Ant Stream has a ton of games ranging from console quality to arcade quality that you stream over the internet on any device. It's similar to Stadia where you can play anywhere, but it has a Netflix style library instead of buying every game individually. Then the other is Air Console, and the service has a neat concept where you use your phone as a controller, which is nice for multiplayer and the service is free if you don't mind sitting through two minutes of ads between each round of a game. The games are fairly basic, but if you need something to play while you wait for Atari to populate the marketplace with games, well, here you go. But I'd rather play Antstream. So let's take a look at the applications. The first being Google Chrome. Now I mentioned in my last video that this is kind of a big deal that it's on here, and I didn't really explain why. You do need permission from Google to ship with it installed, so Atari having Google Chrome on the Atari VCS is significant. With Google Chrome on the system, you can go to any site that you normally would with Chrome, and it's pretty familiar to a wide range of audiences. Now I mentioned Stadia which runs very well on the Atari VCS and you can check out a previous video that I did exclusively on the Stadia service, but some people wanted me to test it a bit further on the Atari VCS and it runs very smooth provided that you have a decent internet connection. 
I'm not really going to do a deep dive on how Stadia runs on the Atari VCS because it's running through a browser, not actual hardware. It runs wonderfully on the Atari VCS and there's no issues that I've run into. Moving on to the rest of the apps, you have the VCS Companion, which is an application for your phone. Now this serves as a keyboard and mouse when you don't have a physical one. The mouse and scroll wheel aren't as sensitive as I would have liked, and it sometimes takes a couple of swipes for the scroll wheel to actually start scrolling, and the mouse isn't that fast, but it comes in handy when you need to type in any information while navigating through the menus or Google Chrome or the apps. I did invest in a lap keyboard, the Logitech K400. It's a keyboard and trackpad all rolled into one, and best of all, it's able to put the VCS to sleep and wake it up wirelessly. The controllers still can't seem to do that for some reason, and this keyboard is really great for cruising the web from your couch. The only issue is, is that I can't go to the home screen in an application with the keyboard. If you're in a game or something, you can exit out and it will take you home, but as far as I can tell, there isn't a specific key that will prompt you to go to the dashboard. The keyboard is only $20 and I'll leave a link in the description below if you're interested in getting one for yourself. The other application is PC mode, which used to be called the sandbox mode, but they changed the name to avoid confusion with a future game of the same name. The PC mode allows you to boot into a different OS from Atari OS, and in this case I chose Ubuntu, which as far as Linux goes is the most welcoming to newcomers. And also you can run it off a USB flash drive instead of installing it directly onto the hard drive. I plan on doing a whole video on installing an OS along with the RAM and SSD to the system, so make sure that you stay tuned for that. Then you have the rest of the applications, and that's putting it lightly. There are actually shortcuts to websites that you can access in Chrome. Normally this wouldn't be that big of a deal, but if you're using it on the TV from your couch, then the only way to control these sites is with a keyboard and mouse, not a controller. Again, it's not that big of a deal if you have the companion app or a lap keyboard handy, but I do wish that they would create something to use with the controller. Well, Stadia will actually recognize the controller and let you navigate that way, but all other sites won't let you. The other issue that I ran into was that I made the mistake of syncing my Chrome browser with my Google account and that caused all the add-ons and apps to be installed. Which wasn't that big of a deal except when you tried to open up any of the shortcuts it brought you to the last big screen application installed, in my case it was Google Hangouts. Of course you can just close it out but you do need a mouse and keyboard nearby. Luckily I had that already but it was still kind of frustrating. And now with that, now's a good time to go over the issues that I had with this UI and offer my suggestions for improvement. Now it's clear that the UI is not retail ready and I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and assume that they're going to improve it over time, but right now here's what's wrong with it listed from minor to big freaking deal. First is the minor grievance, home screen customization. Now we should be able to arrange the icons the way that we see fit, either by alphabetical order or however that we want. And it would be nice to have like a desktop view so that you can use the mouse and keyboard a little bit easier. Right now if you use the keyboard on the UI you can only use the arrow keys, you can't use the mouse. Now let's get into the bigger grievances. Now I mentioned in the previous video that you can't wake up the controller from sleep with a Bluetooth enabled controller. You can wake the console up with the controller plugged in though and they are aware of the issue and they're working on a fix. But the other one that's kind of wonky is that the controllers seem to not act the same on Bluetooth as they would wired. For example, the classic joystick would not function properly in games wirelessly. The joystick would either jut to the left or just stay stuck there. But when I restarted the game and plugged the joystick in wirelessly, it worked seamlessly. The same is true for the Xbox controller. Wirelessly it would control the game just fine, but the menu button, home buttons, and back buttons, those wouldn't work, but they worked on the joystick. So I'm not sure if it's the games that are having trouble recognizing the Bluetooth or if it's the Atari VCS. Either way, I submitted these bugs to Atari, so hopefully they're aware. So there you have it, an in-depth look at the Atari VCS UI as of December 28th, 2020. 
I do expect it to change over time as they get closer to retail launch. And while the UI is basic, it's pretty functional and not a complete disaster. The issues that I mentioned could probably be fixed pretty easy. Like I mentioned in the previous video, the hardware is fantastic, the software just needs work. And when you're making a console, the hardware is harder to fix once it's out in people's hands, but at least with software you can push updates. So that's going to wrap it up for this video. If you want me to go into more stuff, please let me know in the comments below. I do have a video planned for upgrading the SSD and RAM along with installing a separate OS. So be on the lookout for those in the next coming weeks. And if you made it this far, please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Snicktendo. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Super Nintendo, and I'll see you next time.